Okay, uh, third lecture in this series. This one's a short one, thankfully for you guys and for me as well. Uh, it's just touching base briefly on anemic and hem hematopoietic agents. Um, talk about some anemias and common causes. Anemia is a deficiency in red blood cells. So um, measuring it with hemoglobin or hematocrit, mostly looking at the hemoglobin level commonly. Uh, you can see adult men and women for comparison is what's normal there. And definitions for women less than 12, hemoglobin is usually pretty standard. Um, and it really depends on the baseline of a patient. A patient may be baseline a little bit anemic. And um, some patients, it may be difficult to get them above into the certain range you want, but maybe they function okay. They don't have really a loss of energy, uh, but generally it's something to just watch out for. Uh, so the way we approach treatment is a couple of different things. Looking at um, hem hematopoiesis within the body requires a few different cofactors, iron, folic acid, vitamin B12, or cyanocobalamin, and growth factors that regulate uh, production. Um, causes of anemia, there's a lot of factors to consider. Somebody may have frank blood loss, um, maybe heavy menstruation uh, causing that. You could have decreased red blood cell production, which could be due to malnutrition. Increased red blood cell destruction could be caused by hemolytic anemia, um, which could be a different source as well. So um, clinically, the implications of this are going to be patients are going to feel fatigued, dizzy, tired. Uh, they may be pale in appearance, may have some tachycardia and decreased mental acuity. These would be more severe symptoms. Increased mortality if you have any of these comorbidities listed there. Um, as far as diagnosing anemia, you're looking at the mean corpuscular, vo corpuscular volume, and it's going to represent the average volume of a red blood cell. So if you have a macrocytic MCV, your blood cells are larger, microcytic, they're smaller. Um, so the way we look at this is if somebody has a macrocytic morphology, it's likely that they're deficient in folic acid and B12. If they have a microcytic morphology, likely that they're deficient in iron. So we can use our lab values to figure out where we want to target our therapy because it can be difficult to figure out, well, you know, you could just maybe give somebody iron, but if their um, morphology isn't indicative of microcytic, that could mean that they're not iron deficient. And we can test that too. Um, iron deficiency is much more complicated, and I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on it, but um, serum iron uh, by itself is something we can measure. It's difficult to interpret. It's got a variable um, diurnal variation, meaning that it, it changes throughout the day, higher in the morning. Um, and depleting the body's iron stores is very difficult to do, so it can be a little bit of a difficult um, uh it can be difficult to, to, to gather anything from serum iron by itself. Excuse me for stumbling over my words there. Uh, total iron binding, binding capacity is something we can check by looking at serum transferrin iron binding capacity. What this does is represents the body's available iron that it can use. Um, it doesn't fluctuate in people, unlike serum iron. Um, it is elevated in iron deficiency anemia. So if somebody is iron deficient, their transferrin is being increased because they're trying to make more iron available for the body to use. Um, and then serum ferritin is the measure of the body's iron stores. It's probably the best indicator we have of lower iron or iron overload. And the decrease is only in association with iron deficiency anemia, unlike other um, things that can affect decreases in serum iron or decreases in total iron binding capacity. So if somebody's iron deficient anemic, how do we treat it? Uh, we can supplement the iron. There's iron supplements that are OTC and prescription. There's tablets and liquid available. Um, you can increase dietary recommendations, improving iron from red meat or uh, you know, there's multiple sources of iron. Green leafy vegetables can have iron in them too. Uh, there's lots of lots of dietary sources that you can adjust. Again, a dietitian consult may be of help to your patient in this situation. Um, GI absorption is fairly challenging with iron. So, with iron, what you want to do is take it with meat, orange juice, or some other acidic or vitamin C rich food. The acidic environment helps it absorb. Now, the catch twenty two with this is that um, iron is a bit hard on the GI tract by itself. So if you take it with something that's really acidic, you can really compound that problem and end up feeling fairly ill as a patient trying to take this. Um, so the philosophy with this is some iron's better than none. So if somebody, if you say, well, you should take this with orange juice ideally, and your patient says, I can't tolerate it with orange juice, but I can do it with water. Well, that's better than nothing at all. So that's my philosophy. If you can get the iron in, 
some point, try and do it. Um, milk and tea would be things to avoid altogether. They can chelate the iron a little bit, and they can also cause a more uh, alkaline environment that prevents the absorption. <clears throat> uh, other things with iron supplementation, you end up with uh, causing dark feces, so just explaining to patients they might see um, it's not like they're having a GI bleed or anything, but they're probably just taking take took iron, and that's going to darken their feces a little bit. Uh, patients also tend to get constipated, have diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Um, so what I would say is that uh, iron supplementation is useful. There's a couple different products on the market, fumarate, sulfate, and gluconate. They all have different availability of elemental iron. There's not really one that's better than the other. I would just supplement whichever one works. Uh, most people probably use sulfate or gluconate. I don't see fumarate used a whole lot. And um, just titrate the dose based on response. Try once a day if, and then measure their levels again. If it doesn't improve, keep increasing the dose up to a certain point and see. Um, sometimes people will get to three times a day with meals. They take their iron, but once a day is pretty common as well. So most people aren't taking tons of iron. Um, if somebody's on an acid suppression regimen, like a proton pump inhibitor, something like Prilosec or um, uh, Nexium or any of those types of medications, or they're on histamine blockers like um, Zantac or Pepsid, uh, those can impair the absorption of iron too. So making sure that the patient is not on those if they need to be replacing iron orally. We have IV iron too if somebody's really malnourished or has having intolerance to it. Uh, there's a couple different products that I've listed in this table here. And those could be given uh, via intravenous infusion. All right, B12 is something we can consider with dietary intake changes. So B12 is common in dairy, eggs, meat, poultry, and oysters, if you're into oysters, I guess. Uh, B12, uh, so that could be some dietary options for patients. Otherwise, replacing it's really easy. You can give oral products once a day. Um, so a lot of people do an IV or IM shot uh, every week for a uh, uh, or sorry, once a day for a week, and they'll do it every four weeks thereafter to keep themselves um, iron, uh, iron, or sorry, vitamin B12, uh, um, uh, keep the, keep their levels of vitamin B12 up. Um, adverse effects should be fairly minimal. Um, considerations for people with who are vegetarians or have gastric bypass surgery could potentially be at higher risk for vitamin B12 deficiency. And you can get check a serum level to see if this is the case. Folic acid, um, you can contain the serum folic acid level to confirm deficiency. Uh, it's also called folate or vitamin B9. It's a B vitamin. It's contained in a lot of things. Um, but uh, folic acid supplementation is easy too. There's no side effects to it. Uh, one milligram per day uh, is usually pretty common. And uh, one to four months of treatment should see some effect. It's important to note folic acid and B12 have a synergistic effect, so it's important to test for both and are usually people are going to be replacing both at the same time. Uh, growth factors are um, glycoprotein hormones that regulate proliferation and differentiation of progenitor cells from the bone marrow. Um, and what these are doing are going to be used for patients who have low hemoglobin and they may not have necessarily a source of bleeding, so they don't necessarily need a transfusion, but um, they can boost up the hemoglobin a little bit. And um, normally, epogen is made by healthy kidneys. So unless you have a patient who's got some sort of kidney insufficiency, it's probably rare that you're going to need to use a product like this ever. Usually, they're reserved for kidney patients. But um, there's synthetic... Uh, um, product that works just like our endogenous one does to induce uh, erythropoiesis via progenitor cells in the bone marrow. Uh, but again, you're not going to see this very often. Um, colony stimulating factors, I probably shouldn't have included this slide here, so um, don't worry about this slide at all. I'm just going to delete it. And if I can delete it here. And uh, that's it for this lecture. Thanks, guys.